All right, we are back. So guys, just like because there is a disconnect between the two, uh, I have to somehow introduce again. So we have been discussing part three of surgical sorts. We have been discussing a lot today. So we covered uh, Foley catheter, we covered chest tube, rectal tube. Uh, we talked about T tubes and all that. So right now we have been discussing about the triangle of safety and the measures we have to take uh, when we are like, you know, uh, introducing a chest tube. Okay, so I will start from where the uh, recording stopped. So uh, this picture depicts uh, where you can put a uh, chest tube safely. This is area of uh, triangle of safety. And I was talking about uh, trying to stay away from the six interspace and below when we are putting a chest drainage. And that, that's the main reason is in the right side, you may end up injuring the liver. In the left side, you may end up injuring the spleen. Sometimes if you go down, even if you don't uh, puncture these organs, you may end up injuring uh, the uh, diaphragm and you may end up into one of the hollow viscous as well. That has happened. We have seen complications after chest tube insertion. So the triangle of safety, uh, people talk about it a lot uh, is because the main reason is just because if you introduce it here, you avoid those potential complications. So this is a chest tube in action. It has been introduced. People have like, you know, gauze has been applied. It has to be as, as much as possible after you, int you uh, introduce a chest tube. It has to be as much as possible airtight. It has to be airtight because you don't want to allow the patient to continue sucking air into the pleural cavity. And you can see to keep it in place, you cannot rely on a plaster on a gauze. You have to properly, uh, you know, uh, suture it with the chest wall. Okay, that's very important. And you can see blood being drained. And I was talking about this radiopic line. You can clearly see it here. This blue line is a radiopic line. That radiopic line makes it visible on chest X-rays. And that's very important because we want to know whether it is in the right place or not, whether it is kinking, whether it is going directing into, it has penetrated through the diaphragm and has gone into the abdominal cavity. All this information we can obtain by doing simple chest X-ray, right? So this is what? Uh, inserting at a second intercostal space, mid-clavicular line. Okay, that's something else, I've, and Dwalem, I really appreciate you because you brought up a very important uh, question. Uh, that is something else, putting a tube, uh, we don't put a chest tube in the second intercostal space. Uh, rather, uh, if a patient comes to you with tension pneumothorax, I think I have talked a lot about chest trauma, fractures, flail segment, pneumothorax, hemothorax, and everything during the first lecture. So I encourage you to see that lecture. There is a lot of discussion happened, which has happened in that first lecture, which I uh, didn't do with you. I did it a year ago or something like that. Watch that video. There is a lot of information, lots of lots of information in that one. Very re relevant, okay? So you have to make sure that you are watching that video. So. If a patient comes with tension in motorax, you will find it in that video. You go to the second intercostal space if there is tension in motorax. You try to find a hard bore needle, needle, not a tube, needle. And then you insert it in the second intercostal space and you evacuate that air which is under tension. So then that buys you time, that buys you time. So the patient becomes stable and then you can shout for help and then people can bring you chest tube. The definitive management for tension pneumothorax is tube thoracostomy or chest tube insertion is no needle insertion. So the chest tube, whether it is pneumothorax, whether it is pyothorax, whether it is chylothorax, whether it is pleural effusion, you have to put it in a dependent area. It's given, I mean, you know, everything settles. Of course, air, if you put it in the third, it doesn't matter. Fourth, it doesn't matter. Second, it doesn't matter, but it is not going to be comfortable. If you have to put it on the second intercostal space, that means you have to put the chest tube here anteriorly, and then the patient will hate you forever. Technically, it may be easy, but it's not also safe to put a chest tube on the second intercostal space. There are many vas vessels here, man. So superior vena cava, whatever, aorta, this side, many, I mean, the brachiocephalic arteries and veins. So it's, it's really dangerous. So people came up with a triangle of safety because it's away from these vital structures. So whether it is tension pneumothorax, pneumothorax, hemonymothorax, chylothorax, whatever, put the chest to you in that triangle of safety, not on the second intercostal space here. He will hate you or she will hate you forever. And technically it's not feasible. 
and I will kill you if I'm the chess surgeon around. This is a joke. All right. So yeah, I am glad you raised that issue though. Okay, good. NG tube, excellent. So this is an NG tube. So the NG tube, you see this? You can close it if you want, you can open it. This is by design different compared to the rectal tube, compared to the uh, catheter or uh, Foley catheter or the chest drainage tube. This one can be opened. There is a button here, you see this? You can open it, you can close it, you can open it, you can close it. Uh, and this one is blunted. It's blunted, the same principle, just like you know that of rectal tube. It has to glide, right? So it's gliding through the nose, so it's not catching any tissue. So it has to glide smoothly so that the that hip is blunted, but it has multiple holes, you see? Hole, 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 hole. So the NG tube, there are many indications for NG tube. Read about indications for NG tube inception. And one of the reasons is just to evacuate content, right? So for example, if a patient comes with a small bowel obstruction, repeated vomiting, belly is distended. Or large bowel obstruction, the belly is super distended, patient is in pain, patient is vomiting. So you want to insert the NG tube because the NG tube would deflate what is, you know, obstructed. So gas cannot go down, feces cannot go down, intestinal content cannot go down. That's why the abdominal distinction is coming from. And then the pain is so much. So when you put this one, when you insert the NG tube, you deflate it. So you need to have multiple, multiple holes to deflate the air, to deflate the GI content, especially gastric content or stomach content. Or the NG tube might be used for feeding. Sometimes you may use it for feeding. So if you are feeding, you are just introducing whatever food through here, whatever fluid medication through here, then you need the hole because it has to go into the stomach, right? So that's an energy tube. So how do you insert an energy tube? It's very easy. How do you determine how long should you be introducing it? Because if it is two meters or a meter and a half, you wouldn't introduce the entire segment, right? The entire length, no, you don't do that. So how do you determine you have inserted the required length? So the number one thing you can do is you measure from here up to the angle of the mouse. You measure, okay, this tip, this tip right here, this tip right here, you bring it here, then you measure, you hold there. From here, then you bring it here. So you have already measured a certain segment. Let's assume this much from here to here. To here. So you bring it here. You bring it here from here to here. Then you measure from here up to a place where just below the xiphi sternum. So the entire length is, so that one, this one would correct how much it goes into the nasopharynx. This one would correct how much it goes through the nasopharynx. You know, the amount you measure from here up to the xiphi sternum, or just like you know, below the, chest, the thoracic cage, would give you how much it should go. So that entire length has to be introduced. So you mark there, you introduce until you reach there. All right. So sometimes it is not as easy as talking like this. Sometimes patient might be choking. Reason being, if you don't go into the esophagus, rather if you go to the trachea, how do you know whether you are intubating the trachea or the esophagus? How do you know? How do you know clinically? How do you know, guys? Tolo. Pare, pare, pare. We have about 15 minutes for two hours, and after 15 minutes, I will stop. So patient chokes. Yeah, you are introducing a foreign object into the trachea. So patient will choke. No, Bethlehem. I mean, patient is gagging and like, you know, fighting and gasping for air if you are intubating his trachea or her trachea. Then you have to stop. Retract, retract. Come out, come out, come out fast. Take out the tube. You are in the wrong direction, okay? Of course, sometimes we'll gaggle. Patients will like, you know, uh, fight with you, they, they they don't like it because like, you know, the, the gag reflex is is intact. They try to vomit, they try to choke, whatever. So, but I mean, like intubating the trachea and uh, just vomiting because of the gag reflex or trying to vomit is something different. So the basic principle explains the procedure very well to the patient. I'm going to introduce, to introduce this to you. It's going to be unpleasant but it is going to save your life, okay? It is going to save your life. I have to do it, it's a must. I'll be gentle. I will tell you to swallow when it reaches in your throat. So when I tell you, don't fight it, try to swallow it, or at least try to swallow your saliva. 
So that facilitates, you know, the passage of the uh, energy tier. So you have to communicate with your patient. So most of the most of us, we are arrogant, unfortunately. We are arrogant. We are like, you know, goat kind of. We think we are the mini goats. So we go there. We just like jump on the patient without explaining, without getting constant, without describing the procedure. No, that is the wrong practice. Take your time. Describe to the patient you are going to introduce the energy tier. Tell them what to do. When what happens, what should they do? How do they participate? Okay. So if you describe, most of the time it becomes an easy procedure, a smooth procedure. If you don't describe, patient is anxious. On top of that, you are just trying to dig into the throat, and patient gags and vomits and all that. Okay. So you have to describe. Then the auscultation and babbling comes after you have introduced the amount of language you have measured already. Then once it is in, the patient is okay, you are okay, no panic, you are, everything is fine, everything is under control. Then to confirm it, you take a syringe, take air, just attach it here, attach it here, and then bring your stethoscope, put your stethoscope below the xiphy sternum around, around the area of the stomach, and then push push fast, the, I mean, the, the air with a syringe, push it here, and then auscultate at the same time. When somebody is pushing the air, somebody has to put the stethoscope in the epigastrium and listen, and you can hear the air gushing, kind of stuff, then you are sure it's in the stomach. We do that because we are poor. We don't have resources. But the best thing to do would be what? To confirm whether we have put it in the right place or not. What should you do? I told you already. What should you do? What should you do? Excellent, excellent. Image, excellent. And for the imaging, we do have this green line. You see the green line here? Radiopically, all right? So read about indications for NG tube insertion. Complications related to NG tube insertion, contraindication for NG tube insertion. All right, that's your assignment, guys. That's your assignment. All right, so what do you see here? It's for diagnosis, what do you see here? What do you see there? What do you see? NG tube, excellent, excellent, excellent. Brooke, you are back. I like you very much. You know that, right? So that's NG tube. You can see the NG tube. Follow the arrow. Here is NG tube. 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 Whoop. Yes, it's folding within the stomach. The stomach is a bag. That's why it can rotate, right? So. All right, so I will be discussing this and we'll call it a day. Does that sound good? Yes or no? Does that sound good or shall I stop? I will be discussing about this to you now. Thumbs up or thumbs down? Yes or no? Good, Bethlehem, good, I like it. All right. Whether you say stop or not, I made the decision, so I would have continued anyway. <laughs> I'm pretending as if I am a Democrat. <laughs> All right, let me just take a sip of water, okay? Any objection? All right, all right, all right. Good. What is this? I want to get a comment, so I'm getting tired. So it's going to be a lot of questions now. <laughs> so always pray to be the first examinee, by the way. <laughs> the first examinee, because the examiners are in good mood. They are not tired. They are in good mood. They are not starving. <laughs> Uh, but if you are the last examinee and then you are not giving me the right answer, I'm already irritable, tired, starving. You are in big trouble. That's a joke. 
that's not the case. Track your stomach tube. Yes, Ahmed, thank you so much. Mahali, thank you so much. I like you guys. So that's it. It's a tracheostomy tube. Yeah, plastic or metal, it's plastic because there are two types of tracheostomy tubes. There are metallic tracheostomy tubes plus there are plastic tracheostomy tubes. Obviously, this is a plastic uh, tracheostomy tubes. Can you tell me? Now I need a volunteer. Otherwise, I'm not going to talk. So somebody has to tell me the three different things. One, two, three. I need a volunteer. What are they? What is their purpose? Whether we are in a library or at Tarat Kilo in the palace, I don't care. Just volunteer. No, Brooke, I, I don't need. <laughs> you are not going to volunteer. Somebody else. Somebody has to volunteer. I'm trying to encourage you guys to participate. So just volunteer. I mean, like, you know, just give it a try. I mean, you know, I'm here to help you, right? So there is no judgment. No, Bamanat, I, I want to hear you guys. So somebody has to speak up. Unmute yourself and speak up. I pick, go ahead, okay. Oh, that's Brook. Brook, shut up. Who is volunteering? Oh, I, I pick Bethlehem. Excellent. Okay, go ahead, Bethlehem. Don't let him down. He believes in you. So, Bethlehem, go ahead. Betalem worker. Good evening, everyone, and good morning, Doctor. Um, she caused us a background slalla na ba al kafas kut so as her time. So okay. Um, so the, there is the outer canula, uh, the inner canula na the outer iter masale. Excellent, you got it. So this one is up to right there. This is the inner cannula and this is the outer cannula. Can you tell me the reason? I mean, their benefit or their advantage or their purpose? So when do you need a tracheostomy tube? We need a tracheostomy tube for many reasons. There are many indications for tracheostomy tube, which I'm not going to discuss, right? So if a patient has some airway obstruction, upper airway obstruction, for example, right, for some reason, so you have to use a tracheostomy tube, right? So that is the main purpose. So the main the purpose of the tracheostomy tube is relieve obstruction to the upper airway, right? So that's the purpose again. Why do you need this one, for example, Bethlehem? Do you know the reason? Why do you need the obturator? The obturator? You need it at what point? And do you keep it there indefinitely? Because this is the outer tube, right? So the inner tube goes here, the obturator goes here, okay? So obturator goes here and obliterates the inner tube and the inner tube goes into the outer tube here, all right? That's what happens when you assemble it, that's how you assemble it. So why do you need these three different parts is my question, because I will ask you, I mean, if I am your examiner, I will ask you and I want you to know the reason. <clears throat> okay, Brooke, go ahead. You are C2, so just. Um, the outer tube. So we use the obturator to guide, to insert, the guide our insertion of the tracheostomy tube. And then after we insert the tracheostomy, we remove the obturator and then we insert the inner tube. And no, if it was no, a metal... no, let me stop you there. So the inner the obturator goes here. Yes. Okay. So okay. it goes there. So they are together. Yeah. Uh, so since it's plastic, mm -hmm. if it was metallic, uh, the outer tube would have been there permanently, and then inner tube would be there. So I'm going to make your life difficult because I'm bringing the metallic tube. So here is a metallic tube. You, this is the outer tube. You see the inner tube here? Yes. There is an inner tube. If you pull it, it can come out. Yes. You see this holder? So if I hold there and then pull it, this one is a lock. If I yes. rotate the lock and hold it here and pull it, it comes out. This one is the inner tube. It's already assembled. The obliterator, the obturator comes and goes in here which is inside the inner tube, all right? Mm -hmm. So why, what is the purpose of the, this one? The same principle, remember when I told you about insertion of rectal tube, when I told you about insertion of 
uh, NG tube, what happens at their end? What's peculiar to them? It's blunt. The, the it operator. is blunt. It is blunt. That makes life easier for the operator to glide it easily, right? So that is the reason. So this obliterator comes and obliterates this hole. There is a hole right here. This one comes and blocks that hole. And this is blunt, as you see. So that makes life easy when you try to put it in the trachea. It goes down early, I mean, easily. So it's not going to, you know, stack somewhere, or whatever. So it glides easily. And then once you introduce the tracheostomy, you don't need this one. If you keep it there, what happens? If you, keep it, if you keep it there, after you introduce the tracheostomy, let's assume you forgot about it, and what will happen to the patient? Well, there's no point in the tracheostomy, no, the gun. So what will happen to the patient? Stay forward. Tim told you told you <laughs> suffocating the patient because there is no air entry. I mean, you have to introduce this tracheostomy tube and then you block it, another obstruction, airway obstruction. So obliterator has to come out immediately. Immediately. You have to take it out. Okay. What about the inner tube? Why do we need the inner tube? Is a question. So we used to have a very big challenge in the past because we had limited access to metallic tracheostomy tubes with inner tubes. And the type of tracheostomy tubes we had was plastic ones. And the plastic ones we had never had inner tube, very bad. No inner tube, very bad. So always it was a drama. Why? Why do you think that was a drama if you don't have the inner tube? So having the inner tube is a big security. So why is that? So always we used to say, okay, if it was a metallic tube, theoretically we used to teach residents, medical students, if it was a metallic tube, this would have been prevented. Uh, so we don't have it, uh, I mean, uh, the metallic tubes, there is no inner tube. So that was a big discussion. Okay, the plastic tubes were really dangerous. I would say they are very dangerous, but we never had either the plastic tube with inner tubes or the, plastic, the metallic uh, tracheostomy tube with the inner tube. We never had it. So option Salalelan, we used to use that one without the inner tube, no option. Otherwise your patient would die due to upper airway obstruction. So why do we need the inner tube? It's a security, maintain cleanliness since it is removable. Betalem, excellent, it's removable. You know what happens? One of the complication is this tube might be blocked because of secretion, right? So that's why people with tracheostomy, you need to do a continuous suctioning so when the patient is struggling uh, to breathe, they have signs of obstruction, they know it, they can't breathe, breathe because the secretion is blocking it. So they can't breathe, it's upper airway obstruction again. So if it is an inner tube and it is the middle of the night, the nurse comes running to your duty room, hey, come on, Fakada Silasi, get up, get up, your patient with tracheostomy is suffocating. What shall I do? I think it's the tube is blocked. I will come running. So if there is an inner tube, it is my security. I will just simply take it out. So this is the one which is blocked. The inner tube is the one which is blocked. I will take it out. And the patient continues breathing with the outer tube, which is intact. The lumen is intact. It is not blocked. The blockage was in the inner tube. It's taken out. All right, so it's an extra security. Let me take you back to my experience. You have got a tracheostomy tube without inner tube. So the same story, oh, uh, Dr. Fakada Silase, your patient is gasping, he cannot breathe, he's like he's struggling to breathe. I think the tracheostomy blocked. Come, I will be running like hell because it's a much worse scenario. Why? Because that only existing lumen is blocked. There is no security. I cannot simply take it out. So the only option I have is to take out the entire tracheostomy tube. Can you imagine how disastrous that would be? Because there is no way. Either I will try to suck, but the suction may not be successful. They will try. They will tell you, I tried to suck out, but I couldn't clear it. And the patient is gasping. And the saturation is dropping. The action I take wouldn't be suction. I will just remove the entire tracheostomy tube. Imagine how messy that could be. 
there will be bleeding. You have to take the tracheostomy tube out completely. And then you have to reinsert another brand new tracheostomy tube in the middle of the night. Patient is gasping. You didn't give anesthesia. Can you imagine how much frustrating would it be? So it's very important to have an inner tube because when it gets blocked, we can take it out. After we take it out, what can we do? What can we do to make it work again? What can we do? By the way, my questions are simple, common sense questions. So don't ask, don't think big, okay? What do you do after removing the inner tube? Eh, no suction. If you remove it, you remove it, then clean it, yeah. Wash it, take it to the tap water, wash it, whatever, clean it. It has to be clean. It shouldn't necessarily be sterile. So, and then you put it back again. You put it back again. Don't forget, you put it back again. So that way you avoid the outer tube from being blocked. And then you avoid that drama and disaster. You may lose a patient. We have seen people dying. They may die because they suffocate. And like, especially if it is in the middle of the night, that attendant that tendon doesn't find you or the nurse is not opening the door. They are sleeping and then the patient gasps and dies. You know, it's a disaster. So tracheos, if you have a patient with tracheostomy tube, in principle, we always encourage these tracheostomy patients to be, you know, given a room very close to the nurse's station. So if there is a drama, disaster, emergency, you can run and you can go there and act fast. And at the same time, you have to train the caregivers. Unfortunately, most of our patients in Ethiopia are left to the mercy of their attendants, you know. We are not delivering the care we are supposed to deliver. So the attendants, they may not know how to do it, blah, blah. So you may lose a patient. You may lose a patient. All right. So tracheostomy is potentially fatal. So make sure you have got the proper tracheostomy tube. Okay. During discharge, we use metallic tube. So what do we suggest when the tube clocks? The same thing. The, the, I mean, the reason why during discharge we were changing it to a metallic tube was because the plastic tubes which were available in Ethiopia, they didn't, by design, they didn't have any, an inner tube. I used to have I used to have a plastic tube even in Ethiopia, one for demonstration. I kept it with me. I, I had it in my locker, a plastic tube with inner tube. So that was good to demonstrate for them. Even the plastic one comes with inner tube. It depends on the design, but unfortunately, what we used to have in the past, I don't know the situation right now, where the plastic ones were without inner tube. That's why we panic. So if I am sending a patient with a single human tracheostomy tube, that patient might die because they will not have access to a suction machine, suction tube. Nobody will take care of it. If it gets closed, that patient is going to die. I am not going to discharge that patient with a single human tracheostomy tube, no. So, and it was really tough to find a metallic tube in the market. It was a very challenging situation, but you have to do that in principle. That was the main reason. If you have a plastic tube with inner tube, that's fine. You can send them with a plastic tube. So when it gets blocked, the patient is trained, the attendants, is, the attendants are trained. So they would know when they have obstruction, right? When it gets blocked, they will take it out. Even the patient can't take it out. They, they, you, should, you show them how to do it. They'll take it out. They just clean it wash it they can put it back okay so the metallic tube the advantage is that one and the metallic tube why the metallic tube the same reason it's just because it has inner tube the inner tube is this one you can take it out it's just they have assembled it that's why you can't see it but you can see something here right so that's what you pull and there is you see this part here this part is a lock you rotate it it locks you rotate it it opens and you can take it out so the patient knows the attendant knows when it gets clocked they will take it out, wash it, put it back, okay? All right. I think I said tracheostomy, that's enough. So endotracheal tube, I don't know. I don't know how many slides do I have yeah, for in the endotracheal tube. Okay, just one slide, let me finish endotracheal tube. There is a lot to be discussed, but I will stop there. So this is the endotracheal tube. The endotracheal tube by design is different from the chest tube and everything. So if you notice, this end is open, the, tracheal, the chest tube is closed. This one is open, you can see here. So the tubing, which goes to the, uh, to the uh, mechanical ventilator gets attached here. That's why you need this connector. This is a connector. It doesn't come with a connector. The connector, just like the chest tube connector, you can see it in segment going into the tracheostomy tube, right? So uh, into the endotracheal tube here. So the endotracheal tube has a cuff. We call it this a cuff. Uh, and uh, you have got this one, this port here. 
this port, the, the main purpose of this port, just like you know, the port you have seen in Foley catheter is just to inflate the balloon. So we inflate the balloon with a gas most of the time. We just use air. We use an air and then inflate it. We inflate it for a reason. Number one, when you inflate this cuff, because like you know, you see the diameter of this endotracheal tube is not as big as the diameter of the trachea, right? So definitely there will be circumferential free space between the endotracheal tube and the trachea, right? So what that what, what does that mean? It means uh, air from the lungs can leak, right? So if you don't if you don't apply this cuff, there will be air leak, air leaks from the lens, from the trachea uh, through, through the space around the tube. So to avoid that, you inflate this, this inflated cuff would seal the space between the trachea and the endotracheal tube. The space is sealed. So there will not be a leak from here, from the lung and the trachea going up like this, there won't be liquid is sealed due to this inflated cup. Okay, that's very important. It has numbering because the numbering is good, is important because we advance it to a certain level. We don't advance it indefinitely. If you do that, you will end up catheterizing or uh, yeah, intubating only one of the lungs, most of the time the right lung. There is a reason for that one. I know that you know the reason because the right trachea is somehow in direct continuity with the main stem, uh, with, the, with the trachea itself, the right stem bronchus, I mean. The right stem bronchus is almost acute angled, right? So, uh, and it's in direct continuity compared to the left, uh, left main stem bronchus. So uh, right, right lung intubation would result in a collapse of the left lung, in a collapse of the left lung. That's not a required effect. So. The carina is about 25, if I remember correctly, about 25 centimeter from the incisor teeth. From the incisor teeth, about 25 centimeter. So when we advance it, we advance it up to 21, 22 centimeter. So that gives you about three centimeter proximal to uh, the carina. So the tip that if you insert up to 21 centimeter, this is 24, this is 22. So if you insert it up to 22, then from here to here, the tip would be about three centimeter proximal to the carina. So you are intubating the trachea itself. So you are ventilating both lungs. If you push it indefinitely, uh, this is 24 centimeter, 26, more than that, if you advance it, then you are just advancing it to one of the main stem bronchuses and most of the time to the right. That may be done, especially in uh, thoracotomies. If you want to do, for example, right uh, left thoracotomy you intubate only the right lung and then the patient will be ventilating only using the right lung and that is on purpose and we want to collapse the left lung if i'm operating on the left lung or on the left chest i may selectively intubate the right lung sometimes if we are operating on the right side on the right lung we may selectively intubate the left one so that we would collapse the left lung and i can operate on that side Okay, other than that, we don't that we don't want that to happen. So you advance it up to 21, 22 centimeters. There is a slight difference between male and female because there is basic anatomic difference between male and women. All right. So that is it. So it's a long, long, long talk. And I know we have covered a lot. So there is still a lot. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how we can finish. Airways, uh, colostomy bags, colostomies, colostomies, varicose veins, ulcers, neck mass, neck mass amputations, hernias, 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 hernias. And uh, with the request of my dear sir, Brooke, I added today different types of skin ulcers and all that. And uh, surgical instruments, uh, that's at the end, few of them. There is a lot. Uh, unfortunately, I committed myself uh, to uh, one discussion uh, with other people on, uh, on Monday and on Tuesday, I will restart working again. Uh, I don't know when is your exam, guys. <laughs>